Good morning and welcome. These are today's announcements. Tomorrow is the deadline to drop off your items for our OCIM care packages. There are still more items that are needed. Please put your items in Amanda's office. We are going to put these together next weekend while having pilgrimage here at church. All elementary kids are invited to our kids crew outing on Sunday, November 21st at 3 p.m. The details for this event can be found in the weekly nutshell. Family Movie Night, Christmas edition, is scheduled for Friday, December 10th. Join us for pizza at 5.30, followed by the movie with popcorn at 6. Tonight is our last night for Sunday evening Bible study, youth and kids crew. We'll start back on January 9th. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. The God who casts the sea. The God who gives the rest. The God who gathers the grain. Gathers all the people together. We are part of God's family. And we are the heirs of the Lord. Come. Rejoice, pray, listen, and reflect. We celebrate God's presence among us. As we gather for worship, we greet each other in the name of our Lord and Savior with peace this day. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Will you pray with me an opening prayer? Almighty God, we give thanks as we gather together this morning for the fact that you are God and we are not. God, we pray that our eyes and our minds would be open to that fact today as we participate in the sharing of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, show us your goodness this morning. Amen. <laughs> front of us again today another beautiful quilt faithfully made by hands of members of this congregation. This quilt that we have here today will be dedicated to Ruth Williams of Chapel Hill who is recovering from a stroke. I invite you as always to come forward after the service, lay a hand and give a personal blessing over this quilt 
um, in honor of Ruth for her comfort and healing, as well as for the upbuilding and encouragement of Ruth's friends, Jean Crabtree and Allison, uh, by Allison Cecil, I could not read my own handwriting, who love and care for Ruth and who are praying for her through this quilt. And now if you'll join me in the prayers of this congregation, you'll see them printed in your bulletin, which you can take home and continue to pray for all of these folks. I'll pray a blessing over them and all of us now, though. Please join me in prayer. God, this morning, we pray for Ruth Williams and her recovery and for the friends who love her. God, we praise you that Ruth Robinson is at home from the hospital. We pray that she would continue to feel better every day. Lord, we pray for those who are still ill in hospital, for Carol and Kate's in the ICU, and for Mark Martin, a relative of Stephanie Smith, who is sick in the hospital at Regional. Lord, we pray that you would encourage and give encouraging community to Jessica and her husband, Reverend Trey Harris, in Hillsboro, who are having a hard time. Lord, show them love through your own hands and through the hands of those around them. God, we pray also for those who are grieving right now, for Paul Beck and his loved ones on the death of his brother-in-law, and for Iris Tilly as she mourns the death of her brother, Johnny Crabtree. We know that you are a God who is near to the brokenhearted and poor in spirit. Lord, inspire us also to draw near to those who are in times of distress and teach us to pray boldly the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day we pray. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Now I invite our usher to come forward for the offering. While I was driving here this morning through the beautiful fall leaves, I was reminded that God's world is so much bigger than me and my lifetime, and that I am a steward of all of this creation and all of these gifts and blessings that God has given to me. And so as we think about offering, I pray that God would remind us that we are stewards of the blessings of this life, not owners of this world, not owners of the things we have, but stewards of them. God, may we work continuously to bring your kingdom here on earth, knowing that you are God of all that we know. Amen. This morning I will be reading the second chapter of Ruth. Ruth meets Boaz. Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Imelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, a Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean all among the ears of grain behind someone in whose sight I may find favor. She said to her, go, my daughter. So she went. She came and she gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to be the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Imlech. 
Just then Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, The Lord be with you, they answered. The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, To whom does this young woman belong? The servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is a Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came and she has been on her feet from early this morning until now, without resting even for a moment. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, you go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me. And how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds. And may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, May I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord? For you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. At meantime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some of this bread and dip your morsel into the sour wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he heaped up for her some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, Let her glean even among the standing sheaves and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some handfuls from the bundles and leave them for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an epa of barley. She picked it up and came to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gleaned. Then she took out and gave what was left over after she herself had been satisfied. Her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, Stay close by my servants until they have all finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is better, my daughter, that you go out with, this young, with his young women. Otherwise, you might be bothered in another field. So she stayed close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Good morning. Good morning. Let us go to the Lord. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, you could almost see the imprint in the mud as they were trudging and making their way from Moab to Bethlehem. It was not an easy journey for either of them to make. Penniless, we can imagine, bare bones in a way, 
trying to find a way to make a living, even though there were job opening signs, but no one was hiring women at that time. And with no breadwinner at home and no bread to eat, we can imagine they were hungry and bitter, and as we remember from last week, they journeyed in silence together. Now they got to Bethlehem, and no one in town recognized who Naomi was. She went by Mara now, which means bitter, and all seemed to be lost. Life seemed without purpose, without a way forward, no 401k to open up to help them out of their situation, no moving expenses. Really, they didn't have much to move except for the clothes on their back. And so they plugged along with just the spare strength that they had and no energy in their spirits to move them onward. And beyond being picky and discerning, they were starving, empty bellies and broken hearts, unable to concentrate, but knowing that they were getting weaker by the day. And while starvation had set in and no one was pushing them forward, they get to the town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a familiar city to us all, especially around Christmas time. But imagine for a moment a different version of Bethlehem, sort of the same though. There is no room in the inn either for Naomi and Ruth in Bethlehem. There are no friends and family welcoming them home with a party. There's no family reunion with a fatted calf like the prodigal son. No memorial service for Elimelech even though this was his home area and Naomi's sons. And so Ruth and Naomi are very much on their own and they have no way out. They're in quite this predicament and they're widows and in every sense of the word they are destitute and they have nowhere to turn and know not what to do. And here we have the story of them trying to find survival for survival's sake. Ruth says, tomorrow let me go to the field and glean. And Naomi responds, go, my daughter. And without a road map or anyone to guide them, she goes out into the world early in the morning to find a better way. And she breaks that silence with her mother-in-law and journeys in this foreign land as a foreigner, far from her friends and her own family, only with Naomi by her side. But still there's this void that seems that no one can fill. Perhaps in our own lives, we've had similar type moments, critical moments, moments of anguish and misery that have led us on this journey that does not seem to end. They have left an imprint on our lives, the impact at times of trauma or challenging moments in our lives when all seems to be lost. We, we wonder how are we going to get through? And maybe we've been there or we've known someone who's been there who doesn't have a plan that we can grasp onto, no words that can console us, no energy or spirit to revive us. And we wonder how are we going to make it ahead when everything seems pointless, when the weight of our journey gives us no hope in the future. Well, there is a great German folktale and it's adapted by Allison Cox and I adapted a little bit more but it begins with the story of a woman and a woman who has so many problems so many worries so many troubles that at times she wonders how can she handle anything else in the world no one has as many troubles as she does but she remembers a friend who seemed to have a lot of troubles and seemed to deal with them well, to come out on the other side. And she wondered how her friend did this. How did she hold her head still high? So she decides the more she thinks about it, maybe she'll go reach out to this friend and figure out what the secret is. She says, maybe I can ask her to tell me how she deals with her problems, and maybe that will help deal with my own. And so she becomes convinced of this. She reaches out to her friend, knocks on her door and they sit down and they have tea and they chat and she eventually asks her what is the secret of getting over your problems and she says well only you know the right choices for yourself 
But I do have this little bit of advice. And she says, oh, could you share it with me? I wonder what it is. And the friend hesitates. And then she says, connection. This wasn't the advice that her friend thought she would receive. She stayed a little bit longer. It was getting late. And so she decided she would walk on home. And on the way home, she kept thinking to herself, connections, what does this mean, connections? But then she thought to myself, what do I really have to lose? So as she got into bed and turned off the light and got under the covers and she prayed to God Almighty, she said, Lord, please convict me of what this means about being convicted and connected in all of this. Please help me with my troubles. I don't know what else to do. And in the dream that she had that night as she went off to sleep, she found herself in this dream in a candlelit cavern with gray bundles all around her, all shapes and sizes. And walking towards her was a woman who looked very wise, and she asked her, who are you, and what is this place? And she said, why, this is the cave of troubles, and I'm the keeper of the cave, the bundles of troubles. She said, each person walks around in this earth carrying a bundle of trouble on their left shoulder. The dreamer looked to her left shoulder, and sure enough, she had a bundle on her back, one she'd carried all the time, but she did not notice. And seeing all the bundles of troubles before them, she said, if you wish, you can pick out another bundle of trouble and exchange it for another one. She said, really, I can? And so she set down her bundle of trouble, and she looked at all the different bundles, trying to feel the weight, which one felt best on her back. Until finally she said, can I take this one? This one feels just right. And she said, certainly you may. She says, but first, why don't you open it up and see what's inside? So she does this. She pulls the gray uh, drawstrings on the bag. And she says, but wait, these are the same troubles that I came in here with. And the keeper of the cave nodded and smiled. And yes, that's usually what happens. But don't despair. Look on your other shoulder. And there is a lighter load. And in this bundle, wrapped with silver and gold, she opens it up and looks inside at the instruction and sees at that moment that in that bundle, she finds her blessings. Wonderful experiences in her life, what she has learned, her talents, her gift, those who are dear to her, those things that have forgotten in her mind, those things that fill her with joy. And she looks up to the keeper of the cave, and the keeper is gone. And there is a new day before her, light shining in her face, for at that moment she has remembered her blessings. In our scripture today, there is a seeming sense and the beauty and assurance of blessing on the horizon. For how God will provide a way where there seems to be only desolation. For surely we've had that moments in our own lives when our eyes have been open to seeing and being on the lookout for God at work the evidence of God, the Holy Spirit at hand. Often it's akin to driving a new car. When you drive a new car, you often notice the same cars on the road as your own car. It's a weird phenomenon. But the same we can imagine is said when we're looking for God to speak to us about a certain thing. Maybe it's a song on the radio or scripture that we hear or a word of comfort or assurance from someone of faith the ways that God provides. And we see God providing at work through the fields. Boaz, who is akin to Elimelech, his name, remember, means God is king. Boaz's name means the strength that was within him. And from the strength that was within him, he shows kindness and caring because he hears of how Ruth has been a person of faith. He gives her that ability to glean in the fields more than she can eat and provides for her. And he watches for her safety. And God provides through Boaz. Boaz hears of Ruth's faithfulness, how she cared for her mother-in-law, how she moved from Moab, her homeland, moved from her family, and is a foreigner in this land. And the scripture says that Boaz blesses her. We're going to talk more about blessing next week. But hear these words from our scripture today, from verse 12. 
Boaz blesses her and says, May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. We see a blessing that comes from connection. Connection here with family, connection with how God provides when there seems to be no other way, with hope made possible through faithfulness. Now, to be clear in this point, when we read this chapter, and I read it several times this week in preparation, this is not a story this week of some cheesy romance novel. Often when we hear Ruth, we do a great disservice to this book. We almost imagine Angelina Jolie jumping out and this very handsome Boaz and how he's dumbstruck by her beauty and love and so forth. But there's no mention of her beauty. I hate to disappoint anybody who wants to portray that. <laughs> we do a disservice, and that can be a whole other sermon series in itself. But for today, I want us to focus on the power of connection. Think of scriptures that we read even in the New Testament. Give, and it will be given to you, Luke reminds us. We love because he has first loved us. Faithfulness, we know, has the power to beget faithfulness. It is the power of connection. So, beloved, as we go about this week, be open to seeing how God is at work through you. How God may use you to bless someone else's life, just as Boaz blesses Ruth and is seen throughout God's blessings in life. How her faithfulness is made evident, and then his kindness towards her is evident. Connection that lasts generation to generation and shows God's faithfulness throughout and how do we live with this connection to show that there is a God who provides even when we can't see the way? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Beloved, as we have been reminded that we have been washed by the blood, um, a quick question, and I guess a show of hands, has everyone have, has everyone received a paper bag when they came in? And if you haven't, if you'll raise your hand, because I want to make sure. If, if our usher could come forward and make sure that those, if you can keep your hands up, or whoever the usher is today, we've got um, paper bags at the front and then also fellowship hall. We want to make sure everybody um, gets communion. Was that, Pat, were you the one in the back over on this side? Yeah. And thank you for doing that, Chris. Um, As we go forward, um, I invite you to turn in your hymnal to, um, or the bulletin to celebration of Holy Communion. We have with us two on our altar uh, this morning, a chalice and a plate um, to remind us of the feast that we take together. And um, during the times of this ongoing pandemic, we, we do communion a little bit differently um, with our um, to go portable communion um, that we have with us, but nonetheless, it is a feast that we share together. So I invite you to turn um, and we'll share together. I'll read the part that is in lighter print and together the congregation will read the part that's in bolder print. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You have made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He commissioned us to be witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all the nations. And today, with his family, we join around the world. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I invite us all now to take and feast together um, with the bread. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this and often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord, renew our communion with your church throughout this world. Strengthen it in every nation among every people to witness faithfully to you. By the Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, 
and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now I invite uh, Jack DeFabio to come forward for a ministry moment. Hey guys, so I was supposed to announce this um, a couple of weeks ago and then life kind of happened and I didn't, so. But I'm here to announce it now, so it's all okay. So Stanford, or Orange Middle School as it's known now, has become the head collection center for all of the school supplies that's given to all of the schools across Orange County. And as a part of my Eagle Scout project, I'm doing a drive, if you will, for donations of school supplies that are gonna be given to them and then distributed to all the schools across Orange County. And there's something, I typed something up and it's in the nutshell, but in case you didn't see it or didn't have access to it, the things that we need are backpacks with laptop sleeves because every child in Orange County now has been given a laptop. Uh, three ring binders, boxes of crayons, markers, colored pencils, glue sticks, rulers, small scissors, pencil boxes, pencil sharpeners, and then the folders that have like the three rings in the middle that you can put paper on. Um, and one thing that I didn't put in there is all of the items have to be new. They can't be already used or old or whatnot. And those are going to be, I'm going to put a bin in the fellowship hall, and the deadline for those items is November the 19th. So not this Friday, but next Friday. So appreciate you guys' support, and look forward to see what you guys can bring. Beloved, receive this benediction. Let us go forth knowing the power of connection we have with our Lord and Savior, knowing that God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to connect others with our Lord. Use, Lord, our lives. Use the gift of faithfulness to empower others to show the blessing of connection that we have with you so that our lives may be evident of your goodness and faithfulness and blessing even in the midst of challenges that we too may face in life, for we are empowered by you. In Jesus' holy, holy name we pray. Amen. 